It's a genuine pleasure to be standing before you, a pleasure that would not have come about if it had not been for the extremely competent and very efficient uh, planning and uh, pursuing of uh, Dr. Hakim, and I would like to thank him personally as well as professionally. I would like to thank SOAS, uh, London Middle East Institute, and the Center for Iranian Studies. You seem to have quite a hub of activity here, and it's it's, it's just as it should be because London, after all, has been a, traditionally a very strong bastion of Persian studies and Iranian studies, London, England in general. And so it's wonderful to be here in a way, home away from home of uh, Persian, the study of Persian literature and uh, culture, even though it's home, inside home is not much of a home after all. Uh, so in a way, it's not only us who feel in exile, it's also the whole of Persian literature in real ways. Uh, I would like to mention that there is a handout, I hope everyone has it, and I will be referring to it time and again, so please make sure you have that and take a look at it uh, from time to time as I proceed in this lecture. Uh, one of the ideas of these series of lectures comes from, of course, from uh, the fact that I consider myself a historian of Persian literature, which really to me means nothing more than an interest in seeing this literature across time, along what we call in our lingo a uh, diachronic dimension. And as such, I'm immensely interested in and absorbed by a uh, question of change. How how do things change in literature? And I contend, and I have written elsewhere, that uh, this is a literature in which you can see the evolutionary process, the process of a growing complexity, stage by stage, stage after painful stage of it. And to be able to speak about this literary tradition, this aesthetic tradition, uh, historically, is to really shed light not just only on the canon and the culture behind it, but also on certain important questions in uh, articulating and writing about literary history. How can we write literary history without distancing ourselves from the text? Notice that, has not, that question has not been answered as of yet. How can we keep inside the text and start writing about its changes that come about it from within the text, rather than from a, an overall contextual dimension looking into the text. Uh, that would be the approach that I will take in these two talks as well. And uh, I count on you to help me uh, hone up that approach, uh, how to talk about uh, the movement of the exilic mode in Persian literature without distancing myself from the text, which is why you have got the hand that I have uh, requested to be distributed. So let me take you down to where I'm going to, uh, to uh, cite John Lennon, uh, to contemplate a figure of an original exile in a paradisiacal scene. One of the first extant Persian poems, or a fragment thereof, composed well over a millennium, a millennium ago, probably in the plain of Sogd, the birthplace of Persian language and poetry, and considered for long one of the four heavens and earth, consists of a single line of uncertain authorship, most often attributed to a late ninth century poet. We know by the name of Abu Haf Sordi. We don't know anything more about him. It concerns the condition of a mountain deer stranded without a mate in the play. Ahuye kuhi dardash chegune da and I have an image for you. I want you to imagine this Ahuye Kuhi. This is the plain of salt, and this is our mountain deer stranded on the, on the desert. And anyone who knows Persian poetry knows that contradictions of this time, of this kind, the binary opposition between Kuh and Dash, between the mountain and the plain, are the struts and beams of Persian poetry. So you have an Ahuye Kuhi, 
with its lateral hooves very well suited to teal. That's why. I want you to imagine it, please. <laughs> Notice the lateral hooves, how it's made to handle the crags, the rocky crags of the mountain, but may weigh upon him heavily in the plain, soft land of the plain. Notice that right knee, slightly bent, and let's talk about this scene. In a real sense, Persian literature begins with this image and the idea behind it. An exile in the person of a mountain deer and the idea of an observer contemplating it. Imagine Abu Hafsuri standing behind the tree, looking in. Think of the dissonance enshrined in the binary opposition between Ku, mountain, and Dasht in the first hemistic, and how that dissonance makes the twin questions that follow poignant highly suggest, suggested, a simple, stark, black and white, and as you would say, non-existent image, snapshot of a mountain deer whose well-hooved, well-developed lateral hooves enable him to clear the, the rocky crags, but can hardly support his weight on lowlands, concretize the theme of exile in a single snapshot. Ahui kuhi dardash mountain deer in the plain. The suggestion that someone observing the animal is asking the question adds a degree of sophistication to this simplicity. Is the deer running or trying to run in vain? Look at his right knee, slightly bent. Does this mean he's striding the plain just fine? Thank you very much. To the marvel of our imaginary observer, or is he beginning to falter, eventually to fall down? Could he be standing still? Some notion of running, taking only, taking shape, lurking only in the onlooker's head. Is the deer perhaps fallen or about to fall? Provoking a rhetorical question, underlining the idea that, of course, the mountain deer cannot contain to continue to run through the plain. And here's the proof. The three perspectives, the deers, the observers, and yours, the modern readers, are still teasing our mind when the notion of the mate, the yar, that precious pearl of Persian poetry, that darling word in the entire tradition, enters the scene. In the second line, it hits us, unador as yar. What does that wonderfully suggestive word do to the question or to the poem? As her entry is announced to our imagination, the question shifts from how the deer runs to how the deer exists, bovazo, or how he exists really. The presence of the concept making visible a crucial absence changes the axis of the poem from one of the deer's function running to the poem's existence. From Davazo to Bovazo stretches the path that the mountain deer must run, but can't, or can he? Let's take a moment to contemplate that question. In all likelihood, the word chegune, or to come closer to the Central Asian pronunciation of the word in classical times, chegun, that word chegun, to adopt a more likely pronunciation of it in classical Persian of Central Asia, where the scene is likely to have been observed, did not necessarily carry the connotation of logical impossibility it now has taken on in modern and modernist Persian poetry. Trace the word chegune in modern and modernist poetry. Chegune istadam o didam zamin be zir do payam ze tekegah tohi mi shavad va garmi tan joftam be enzevay pooch tan ham rah nemi barad. That's Farukhza. I can cite many other examples. So the question here becomes completely rhetorical. It's not a serious question. If you want to ask a serious question, say Chetor in modern Persian. But that was not the case in, in, the, in the 10th century. And as such, 
That's one of the things that a historian of literature takes into consideration, these minute differences. The question has been encumbered, the word has been encumbered already after a thousand years of usage. So it is entirely possible that our imaginary observer is seeing a mounted deer doing fine in the plain, not just walking and running all right, but exhibiting a state of well-being otherwise as well, even, within, even without a yard. Then there's the human being, man or woman, contemplating the scene. Who is this observer of the mountain deer in the plain? Asking that, so those simple, terrible questions. Chegune davazo, chegune bovazo. Any elementary reading on the animal portrayal, portray, animals portrayed here, tells us that although the deer usually live in small bands, the male of the species is prone to run solitary, at least in some seasons. Of course, we can ask whether our deer is really male, but what difference does it make? Or whether the observer here may be projecting his or her own thoughts and emotions, fears and concerns on the scene. After all, we humans have done that for as long as we have shared this planet with animals. Is the observer then possibly lamenting his own separation, his own exile from his own mountain without his own companion? Is this verse in the end the record of a lonely, loveless life? Reading about poetic personages like the mountain deer and his absent companion, thinking about the man or woman contemplating the scene and mulling over the things absent from it or present in it has been my preoccupation ever since I raised my hand to ask a 13 year old version of the same question of our high school teacher. And he invited me to sit down and shut up because it was obvious to him that the line had been there in our textbook in order to tell us the old conjugation of bovaza and davaza. So literature, how do we think about it? How do we approach it? How do we examine it? Uh, that's the question I'll be asking these two nights. Questions such as the ones, this one line occasions have been on the lips of Persian literature for over a millennium. The 10th century epic the Shahnameh, or Book of Kings, and other early works feature a galaxy of exiles. Salman Tur, those unsympathetic straw men, straw men made necessary by the turn in the mythical narrative from the universal to the national, can be recast as prototypes of exiled men. Their crime of fratricide, they kill Iraj after all, their crime of fratricide not so much attributable to the jealousy they felt for the younger brother, having been given the fairest of the lands, Iran, but to a terribly twisted manifestation of their desperate desire to return home. In his infancy, the white-haired Zal cannot but be seen as so different from other newborns that he has to be expelled from human society and exposed at the foot of Mount Alborz. His whole youthful life, an effort to return to the Zabulistan of his human condition. The effort reaches its successful conclusion, not so much when his father accepts him back, but when he demonstrates his capacity for loving a woman from a faraway land, Rudabir. Zal's grandson, Sohrab, too, wishes to return, not so much to the land of Iran, as to the heroic culture of which his deadbeat dad has deprived him so cruelly. Alas, he attains that wish as he breathes his last, making one last wise observation. Shekari miksar hamipishemat. We are all pray before death. And Siobash, contemplate that peaceful prince, that prince of peace, archetype of voluntary expatriation. He falls victim to the very violence which he's trying to avoid 
by choosing to live away from his beloved homeland. Exiling himself to Turan, he is doomed by his very pacific nature, manifested in surpassing his peers in war games, superseded by his aversion to bloodshed. Finally, to cite a single example from the myth, not the, from the myths not enshrined in the Book of Kings, contemplate Arash the archer, Arash Kamangir. He marks the physical boundary between Iran and the lands outside of it, the un-Iran, not just to the Northwest, but inside the mind of Iranians of all ages. Iran ends where the will of his citizens to defend it by giving their lives collapses. In the process, Arash becomes the other of the exiled hero, the man who claims the land, the embodiment of a territorialized sense of identity worth dying for. So no matter where you go in Persian literature, classical and modern, you see exiles, you meet exiles. The important thing is how to recognize them. What is exile in each case? The important thing is to, to imagine the scenes to intimate the text, not to distance yourself from it, I would argue. The point I'm trying to make here is that to Ferdowsi and all those involved in the Persian epic and narrative traditions, and more importantly, to those Iranians in the early centuries of Islamic Iran who fostered the dream of their culture's resurrection, the idea of Iran must have seemed transposed from the, from the recesses of the individual psyche to the pages of diverse literary works. Contemplate Gorgani's Bisen Ramin or contemplate Nizami's many romances. So tonight and tomorrow night, we are going to contemplate the display of this, this display of experience, this wonderful experience of being in exile that really, in a way, epitomizes the human condition in our time. It must be hard for us, for us, reading classical Persian literature from within modern mythologies of writing and reading, of nations and languages, and of individuals and collective identities, to grasp the significance of such myths to those who were trying to find their way to centers of political power and privilege, where the art of poetry faced the task of forging a sense of collective identity at odds with all the rest through language, through the crafting of this beautiful Persian language. Many generations of poets and patrons. It must be even harder to imagine how the theme would be articulated by those who viewed the world in its entirety as a place of exile. This is a few generations later when mysticism, the mystical discourse, takes over <laughs> Persian literature in general. Home being where we were on the day of Alast. To pre, or pre-eternity, up in some paradise, now lost, and in the presence of some god, no longer even imaginable. And what if some sort of mist-like concept of exile began to cover the ground and came to us in the form of a plethora of etherealized mythic manifestations of an eternal wanderer. Not too dissimilar from the wandering Jew in Western literature, or the flying Dutchman, or the figure of that accursed and dying mariner in Coleridge's terrible poem, The Ancient Mariner. And yet, that's exactly the kind of thing that we must do. If we want the past to be meaningful through this, ma this magnificent edifice we call Persian literature. So let me begin with a poet who really experienced exile and has left us with a record, record of it in so many of his poems, beginning perhaps a century and a day after Abu Hafsa's observation of the mountain deer in the plain. Nasir Khosrow of Qobadiyan merits special attention also, not just because he has experienced two centers of culture and spiritual refinement in his life, but more importantly for our project, because he provides a link with the mystical conceptions of exile, which we'll be treating shortly. First, it is true that while it is Khurasan that has brought him up as a man 
and a poet, it is Cairo, that wonderful center of faith and culture where he got to meet his master and spiritual guide that beckons to him from the place, his place of exile, the horrible valley of Yomgan. To have him, a poet and an educated man, in the valley of Yomgan, surrounded by towering peaks, is not just an undiscovered gem buried, you know, he's known as Lale Badakhshan, an undiscovered gem buried beneath tons of, tons of quarry rock, but like discarding or intentionally burying a ruby that was once mine and whose value was determined and is a proven quality back into the quarry under the piles of rubble. Of rubble. And here I, want, I invite you to turn to your uh, text number two on the handout, please. قریبی می چه خواهد یارب از من که با من روز و شب بسته است دامن قریبی دوستی با من گرفته است مرا از دوستی گشته است دشمن ز دشمن رست هر کوجه است لیکن از این دشمن به جستن نیست رستن قریبی دشمن سب است که از تو نخواهد جز زمین و شهر و مسکن به جز با تو نیار آمد چه رفتی کسی دشمن کجا دید است از این فن Interestingly, in the Qasida where the above lines uh, constitute the opening, the poet mentions not just the downside of life in exile, but also its constructive impact on, on the intellectual growth and spiritual development of the individual seeker as well. At one point, and this is not on your handout, Nagardat mard mardum juz be gurbat, nagirat qadr baaz andar nishiman. به شهر و برزن خود در چه یابی جزان کن کندران شهر است و برزن so it is by moving away that you grow it is by experiencing exile that you work your way towards character completion perfection in another passage he asks rhetorically what will you find in your native town your neighborhood except the little that's there in that town in that neighborhood so movement becomes part of a human condition, which is why we need to expand our notion of exile, not as just destructive and diminishing, but as a way of growing, especially today when it's, when it's so much a part of the human condition. A generation later, to Masoud Saad Salman, while the court of Ghazneh remains the privileged space where he has grown in power and stature, indeed, where his art is, has flourished, his native city of Lahore emerges as a place of the poet's fondest memories to be recalled with affection only after he has fallen from grace and is exiled. Here's his own excer excerpt. Here, here's uh, an excerpt from one of his lament poems, the Tristia. And I invite some young colleague of ours to do a study of Tristia, of, of the Qamnames, of poets on the sorrow of life in Persian poetry, because there too, it's a wonderful uh, quarry of, to, to be mined. About his, uh, about his separation, his birthplace of Lahore. Eilavahur, here's, I'm, I'm on uh, handout number three. Eilavahur veyhak bi man chegunei bi afta be roshan roshan chegunei ey baag tab en az man arast tura bi gul bi lale wo banafsh wo susan چگونه ای؟ ناگه عزیز فرزند از تو جدا شده است با درد او به نوه و شیون چگونه ای؟ بر پای من دو بند گران است چون تنی بی جان شده تو اکنون بی تن چگونه ای؟ نفرستی هم پیام و نپرسی به حسن اه کن در حسار بس تو چو بی جن چگونه ای؟ How many times have we experienced this kind of a lament from our peers today in our modern spaces of exile? We know that the early masters of Persian Qasida and Ghazal, and both of these, these are excerpts from large, longer Qasidas. Unfortunately, the Khurasani poets are so long-winded that they think they have to exhaust all the, all the rhyme and language before they end the poem. They just have not been able to, to discipline themselves to stop at some point in the Qasida. So a Qasida goes on and on and on and on. And that's true about all the Khurasani poets from from Nasir al-Khusro to and, and Masoud al-Sa'ad al-Salman, 
to uh, Bahar and Akhavan and Khoi, uh, your, your fellow neighbor in this country. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, an alluring genre. It tests because it's so, such a public means of address. It's such a wonderfully occasional uh, and formal genre that you want to test your, your craft, craftsmanship in the poetry as well. So uh, we know that the early masters of the Persian Qasida and Ghazal often lamented their separation from their native environments, as well as from places where they were allowed to flourish by practicing their art. The nostalgia that oozes from the lines above is not from, for a lost country, unlike us, we oftentimes give it the name of Iran, even though what we miss may be the turn in our own little alley of childhood somewhere. But we generalize that to an abstraction called Iran. For a lost country, not nor for a, convention, a, a, a conventional poetic pose, it is rather for a far more specific and immediate feeling of being away from one's birthplace or some real urban center where the poet's craft was appreciated or rewarded. Notice, when you left your provincial town, or I did, when I left my provincial town of Mashhad and came to Tehran at the age of 19, I didn't view that as exile. I viewed that as, as part of my growth. But when we were thrown out of Iran, it, that, that became exile for some reason. That's, of course, because the mythology of nationalism or nationalistic patriotism that I will be discussing tomorrow night. Yet, it is obvious that the sense of belonging to Lahore and the feeling of resembling a body without a soul is there in the poem. At times, this conception of exile can be expressed in the idea of separation, concretized in images of unpleasant or dangerous animals, such as we see in Manu Chehri's Raven of Separation, Qurab al Bain. As you know, Manu Chehri was a master of Arabic poetry as well, and, and, and he has this image of Qurab al Bain, the Raven of Separation, that really eats his soul. Uh, or Nasir al-Khusro's scorpion of exile, Kajdum al-Qurbat, or Sanai's demon of exile, Diva al-Qurbat, to cite only a few of the, more, the, the numerous examples that concretize exile as an, inju as, injurious, uh, as an injurious state affecting the person of the poet as well as the personas he creates in his poetry. It is important to note, though, that the poetry calling his native city after his, he has fallen from the favor of an important patron and from the lofty position of a court poet which, he gave, which gave him his power and prestige. Thus, in accordance with the public and ceremonial nature of the genre, the qasidi, exilic mode in the Persian qasidi begins to take shape through addresses and apostrophes that picture the, a grieving poet stuck in some cultural wasteland recalling the capital where he ought to be present, but from which he circumstances have exiled him, kept, kept him away. In a sense, this is the reverse of the situation Farrukhi, uh, when, when Farrukhi is taking his poetry to Ghazni. He's young, he's an up and coming poet, and he's taking his way to Ghazni, where it, that's where it's at, no, nowhere else. It's in Ghazni that someone will buy his poetry. Uh, in such works, the apostrophe to the city or court where, where he would prosper, but from which he has been exiled, contains his lament against fate and the hunchback heavens that have, have, have affected his, the misfortune of life in effect. Just as Psalm has done Zal wrong by driving him away, the king would be unjust for turning the poet away from the locus of his court. Or take Nasir Khosrow's in his exile in Yomgan, remembering Khorasan, or Mas'ud in Ghazni, recalling the beloved Lahore, or Sana'i residing in Bakh and remembering Ghazni. All of these, these conditions, there's nobody to carry their message to the patron, so they oftentimes end up addressing the wind as the messenger. That's how the wind begins its, 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 its uh, mission as the messenger of Persian poetry. In Hafiz, you see uh, the wind, the zephyr, so often, so often uh, uh, taking messages from the lover to the beloved, and if there's any message from the beloved, rarely, of course. So there's nobody to carry their message to the patron, the place are, or the people who have unjustly and cruelly rejected them. So this scene, this is scene one. 
of, of the, of the uh, poetry that I'm trying to uh, communicate, of exile. Now we come to a section of my talk, which I call the progress of the solitary soul. It ought to be obvious how in our search for the exilic mode in Persian literature, we're approaching the portal of the mystical tradition. In the mystical tradition, an amazing thing happens, and that is the whole world is a place of exile. The poet begins to recall the Ahda Alast, the covenant of Alast, of pre-eternity, when God said, Alastu barabbakum, am I not your Lord? Your Lord? Alu bali, they said yes. And that became the beginning of a bala. Sanai says, as bara yek bali, kandar azal gofta as jan, ta abad mard bali, and that bala ofta das. So the whole of the world is a place of exile. It's not this city or that place. This we can see in Sayyid al Ibad, al al Ma'ad, Sanai's famous work. You can see this in Mantegote. It often amazes me how much we neglect when we distance ourselves from the text. A few years ago, I wrote an article comparing the image of Simorg, that wonderful bird of Persian poetry, in the Shahnameh, uh, com contrasting it really with its image in Mantegote. And it seemed to be the only, the only thing around that did it that way. We have, we have seen both of them, how in the Shahnameh, the Simur is a real bird, the size of 30 birds, corporeal. When she lands, she raises the dust. She talks to Zal and so on and so forth. And yet, in Mantakote, it's not a creature, it's a presence. Somewhere on Mount Qaf, in some mirror-like surface. So, I'm leaving all of that to take you to a very little, very little read text, really, and that is Sohrebardi's Vesatul Qurbatul Qarbiye. I often think that Sohrebardi's position in, in transforming Persian literature from what I call the objective mode of presentation to the in, to in, interiorizes it from the objective to the subjective. Imagine the struggles and the ordeals of Rostam and compare those with the ordeals of Sheikh Sam'an, fighting his own nafs, his own animal nature, whose struggle is more, is harder, more arduous. Imagine Jam Jam, that wonderful crystal ball. It's a crystal ball in the Shahnameh, but it's not a crystal ball in, 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 in mystical literature. It's interiorized. No matter where you turn, you see the devices of Persian poetry interiorized because now the challenge is interior. The challenge is inside the human being. It's no longer a diva or demon. It's your own naft that you have to fight to work your way towards purity. So my choice is dictated really by my, my desire to find the likes of the mountain deer in the plain. And so here I have, but also, I want to show you the movement from the very, simil very similar, which is what I call, it's, it's part of the jargon of literary theory, to the allegorical and the symbolic. You'll see a similar, a similar transformation tomorrow night as I talk about certain modes of presentation, let's say in Nadirpur and Khoi on the one hand, and in, in uh, Qasimi and Mas'udi's novels on the other. So the symbolic depiction of this person, this personage in, in Ghassatul Ghurbatul Qarbiyeh is wonderful to behold. And here I'm taking you to uh, hand out to uh, your handout, citation number four. Chun safar kardam ba baradar khud asim az diyar ma var on nahr ila bilad maghrib pas bi uftadim nagahan bi dihi ke ahl u zaliman a'na madine ghayrovan. پس چون از قدوم ما آگاه شدند و بدانستند که ما پسران شیخ هادی ابن الخیر الیمانیم بگرفتند ما را و ببستند به سلسله ها و اقلال و به زندان کردند ما را در چاهی که قعر آن را نهایت نیست و بود بر بالای آن چاه که به حضور ما آبادانش کردند قصری مشید و بر وی برج های بسیار So to the two brothers are incarcerated They receive a letter delivered by Hupo this is where the fortunes of Hupo 
begin to rise uh, here and also in Mantegote where he becomes, you know, becomes the Hodhode Hadishede, the, the guided uh, seeker. Delivered by Hupo from their father Hadi in which they are in instructed on how to find their way to deliverance and are informed on, the, on, uh, on all that awaits them along the way. It is an arduous path indeed involving sea voyages and shipwrecks, a visit to the island of Gog and Magog, an encounter with the skulls of Ad and Thamud, sacrifices of their sister and mother, and so many numerous other ordeals. In the end, the travelers ascend Mount Sinai and again and gain an audience with their father, an old man from the brilliance of whose light the heavens and earth were nearly split open. None of the mystics call this thing God, but it is an image of God. So he addressed, the father addresses the sons, and here's what he says, number five on your outline. In bar to ra baz gashtan be dunya zaruriist, velakin to ra besharat midaham be dochiz. Yeki an ke chun aknun be zindan baz gardi, mumkin as ke digar bar be ma baz resi, va be behesht ma baz gardi. Dovoman ke be akhar baz gardi. و به خلاصی یابی به آن شهرهای غریب را جمله رها کنی. It's amazing, this شهرهای غریب اور بلاد غریب. When Hafez says, من از دیار حبیبم نه از بلاد غریب. He's really giving his own version of the mountain and the plain. Sohrevardi's engaging narrative compels the reader to set out on her own journey in search of the parallels that make, make it meaningful in ways that are relevant to the specific brand of illumination philosophy. In other words, I contend here that really uh, here Sohrevardi, the poetic uh, amateur, shall we call him, or the literary amateur, is really serving Sohrevardi, the illumination, illuminationist, the master illuminationist. He is putting the devices of literature at the service of his own ideology of illuminationism. For many, for my purposes, I would like to offer a reading of this tale and by extension of all of Sohrevardi's tales of initiation. He has got a dozen of those. Not just as one of the most comprehensive expressions of the condition of exile in, in the Persian mystical literature, but as one of the most palpable articulations of the longing the mystic feels in a very real and deeply felt human sense. In Rumi, contemplate the nay. It has been exiled, uprooted, cut away from Nehistan. And all of that lament is because it seeks to return to the reed bed. An exile representing the whole of human being. Contemplate all of so many mystical, mystical texts where the effort, the ultimate effort, is to reverse the Adamic cosmic fall and work your way through a cosmic ascent. It was, the moment of Adam's fall was a, a moment of catastrophe. We were exiled. And so we have to crawl our way back to that mountain once more, once more. To, meet, to arrive at Laqa Allah, which is a Sufi term for, for, for to see the face of God. So, our, mount, our, our mountain deer has come a long way, really, come to think of it, from the plain of Sogd all the way to what? The seven valleys, the half wadi in, in Mantegote, in uh, Conference of the Birds, to move from Qairovan to the presence of God. In so many ways, you can use the analogy and you, see, you can see it grow in complexity in, before your eyes, grows in compl complexity. So I know of no such narrative of exile more beautifully designed or more perfectly expressed at once comprehensive and totalizing and yet completely open to non-mystical interpretations. That's the marvel of, of, of Sohre Vardi, I would contend. And then I get to the next section of my uh, talk, the city, the world, and the soul. And what I say here is, of course, no survey of Persian literature along the historical dimension is complete if you do not mention Hafiz. I wish I could skip him because he's so entrapping, but I can't. 
So let's contemplate Hafiz. The, the question about Hafiz is that all of his articulations of the exilic condition must be seen as to be creations of his own lovely, li lively imagination because we have no cogent reason to believe that he ever absented himself from the city of Shiraz. People talk about a little trip to Yaz, but it could have been just you know, a, 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 a tour that he took of the city and he didn't like it at all. So as such, he provides proof, if proof were needed, that in poetry, the most effective is uh, the most effective is often the most fictive, the most fictional. The more you, which is which is which is said in that wonderful Arabic thing, "Ahsanahu uh, akzabahu," the more you lie, the closer you get to the truth, and you create beauty. That's the that's the function of literature. In a historical sense, too, Hafiz closes the circle opened by the masters of the Qasida and the Ghazal. Of all the poets who have shaped the lexicon and imagery of mystical poetry in Persian, he is most consistent in articulating exile as a condition of being away, not from a city, not from a city, but from the beloved. So the balance between Yar and Diyar, which began with, with, with the mountain deer uh, being displaced and having been left without a yard, tilts towards the yard. So in the end, if you've got your yard, you're, you're okay. Uh, in him, as in Sogdi five centuries ago, earlier, the yard and yard node manifestly gravitate toward the former. For him, the abode of the beloved is the homeland from whence, he, uh, whence lovers have been separated. So, Thus, in one poem, he, what, he, 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 he has this marvelous line, در چین تره تو دل بی حفاظ من هرگز نگفت مسکن معلوف یاد باد. Notice the word چین. And it's two meanings. The Kerr and China. So he's in Shiraz. He imagines his beloved, beloved in, in چین. Uh, and, and, and of course, his del has left him and gone to ch China or has gone to the, to the turn of the, of the tresses. And he feels fine at home, thank you. He's not an exile. He is where he wants to be. It's just that he has been separated from his own maskane ma'aluf in the chest of the port. So I have selected another, a few lines from another ghazal, and here's my outline number, uh, my text number five from the outline, from the handout. Uh, I, I heard that Dr. Jahanpul mentioned that he too once, once uh, sought advice from Hafiz and got exactly the same, the same ghazal. It's, it's, not, it's not wonderful. He has done that to, to others as well. You're in, you're in good company. Namaz shaam gariban chu giriya aghazam be muye haay gariban qisse pardazam be yaad yaar u diyaran chunan be giriyam zaar ke az jahan rah u rasm safar barandazam. Man az diyar habibam نه از بلاد قریب مهیمنا به رفیقان خود رسان بازم. And notice, he has not traveled. She has, if it's a she. So, uh, in the last line, the speaker defines himself as once again as the inhabitant, inhabitant not of any physical place, but of the land of the beloved, Diyar Habib. Thus making it clear that any sense of attraction he feels toward a place arises from the fact that the beloved resides there. Later in the poem, he reiterates both the connection and the hierarchy by calling the heir of the beloved abode, Havaye Manzile Yar. And you see phrases like that in Hafez sprinkled all, 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 all over his divan. Diyar Dust, Diyar Dilbar, Kuye Dust, Kuye Yar, Kuche Ma'ashuk. And so on and so forth. So to recap, our mountain deer has come a long way indeed, not just along the way from the plain of Sogd in Central Asia to the southern and western cities, such as Isfahan and Shiraz, real and imaginary, and not just in time from the 10th to the 14th century, but from the simple, specific image of a solitary or a snapshot of a solitary soul stranded but still having his feet planted on the terra firma of some real geography, having now been transformed from a real creature to a more malleable figure that may or may not be the poet, 
caught in a world that is not necessarily the objective world out there. It's an imaginary space, somewhere in the human soul. Our initial impression of him and his abilities has changed as well, of course. It's not just a matter of a single entity in displaced in a simple place. There are so many equations for Hafez and for us to consider. The reed bed, I mentioned that one. The changing colors and climes of seasons and so on and so forth. And I'm skipping a lot here. But let me get to uh, the penultimate part of my talk, and that's the expatriate as explorer and teacher. I argue that the next important shift in the presentation of the exilic mode in Persian literature occurs in the 16th and 17th century as the Safavids settle and make a court of Isfahan, and some of them, for their own purposes, begin resume patronage of poetry, but only of a particular kind, of uh, that, that which now serves the official uh, religion of Shiism. Uh, some some secu more secular poets uh, begin to go to India. And here I'm going to skip quite a number of pages because I know I'm, I'm going beyond my time. Uh, but at the same time, it is the image of the exile that becomes insubstantial. It becomes more ethereal. It becomes less palpable. It does not have the solidity of the mountain deer in the plain. Notice how when Bahshi Bafri of the 16th century says, شاعر قانعم مجردگرد از همه چیز و از همه کس فرد دو جهان پیش من پشیزی نیست هیچ چیزم به چشم چیزی نیست آرم از صحبت جهان آر از صحبت جهان دارم فخر از خاک آستان دارم So belonging not to anything or not claiming anything but really remaining content with the minimum of what, you, what you've got and time and again you see these mythical birds appearing once again, not just Simov, but Homa and Anga as well. In one, in, 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 in one uh, poem, uh, Kalim, who has this famous ghazal about Badnam uh, Hayat, he says, Dar kishema tajarrud anga tamam nist, dar qeydenam mand, agar az nishan gozasht. So even one nishan is too much belonging. You really have to become mujarrad, become, become abstract, abstract yourself from everything uh, in order to seek, seek proximity to the ultimate source of existence. But there's that dimension as well, where India, especially the northern Indian courts of Akbar and Jahan Shah, and, and of, 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 of Shah Jahan and so on and so forth, become important centers of Persian poetry. So Sa'ib, Fayyaz Lahiji says, Habbaza, هند کعبه آمال خاص یاران آفیت جورا هر که شد مستطیع فضل و هنر سفر هند واجب است دورا So the poets begin, begin to make their name rise to fame in Iran but then make their fortune in India because it's the, the patronage has shifted from, uh, from Iran proper the course of Khorasan uh, 500 years previously to the courts, uh, the, the courts of Delhi and Agra and so on and so forth. Or Saeb, 16th century, 17th century, he says, پیش از این هرچند شهرت داشت در ملک اراق سیر ملک هند سایب را بلند آوازه کرد. And finally, I get to uh, my text number 10, and that's, that's by Bidil. Uh, unfortunately, very few Iranians know uh, Bidil, but he is as important as Hafez. And Bidil Shinasi is an important area of investigation, investigating this, this poet's uh, thought, especially because he, was, he comes closest to a secular, hedonistic kind of uh, thought as he articulates in his poetry. So a Persian poet of India in the late 17th and early 18th century builds up on the figure of the archetypal lover in the Persian tradition, that's Majnun, to make his point about exile from human society. And here's on my, I'm on my uh, text number 10. Ya'se majnoon akhir az pich o khame souda gozasht ba shikasti saakh dil kas turre ye leila gozasht. Ham az awal baid az vahm du alam bugzari warna imruz tu khahad di shudu farda gozasht. Jush ashkam dar nazar mujist kas dar ya ramid shu'le ya aham 
به دل برقی است که صحرا گذشت چند چون گرداب بودن سر به جیب پیچ و تاب می توان چون موج دامن چید و زین دریا گذشت کاش هم دوش قبار از خاک بر می خواستیم حیف عمر ما که همچون سایه زیر پا گذشت هستی ما نام پروازی به دام آورده بود بینشانی بال زد چندان که از انقا گذشت In such articulations, these and other poets of the so-called Indian school in Persian poetry depict exile not in any corporeal form and not related to the lives of real flesh and blood creatures, such as the deer or us human beings, but through shadowy figures that inhabit a liminal space somewhere between this world and the next, between the known and the unknowable, between that which is experienced and that which can barely be imagined. From the solitary image of the fratricide came through the ghost-like silhouettes of Khizr and Gog and Magog, Ya'juj and Ma'juj, the mythical presence of presences as Homa, Anga, and Simur, we have an extension of the image of exile that connects the real, that, that connects the real to the fantasized. The history of British rule in India and the decline of Persian there is itself a huge area of investigation. I invite you to uh, look into that. But my main concern is that uh, through the 19th century, inspired by nationalistic feelings of different types and intensities, almost all diverse groups of Iranians began to redefine the relationship between the languages in which they spoke daily and the ones in which they express themselves when writing poetry. So you see a chasm opening up between what we call today the colloquial Persian and the language of, of, of literary Persian, especially the classical texts. In their quest for authentic and, and original identity, different nation states that spoke the same language, let's say not only Iran, Afghanistan, and Tajikistan, but the courts of Northern India, the, the Caucasus, and the Ottoman Empire. Uh, so these nation, nation states born of such concerns develop divergent perceptions of the origins of their own nations. The waning of Persian in Caucasus and the Ottoman Empire and in the Indian subcontinent in the late 19th century brought about radically new configurations of Persian literature as limited to a few nation states such as we know today. At the same time, Iran solidifies in the shape that we see today in our maps. One important development arising from the reconfig this re reconfiguration was the development of a literary language in Iran that held problematic, yet very important, relations with the language of classical poetry. That's why so many people posit a revolutionary change, a kind of sea change between modern and classical traditions in Persian literature. Whereas uh, I have argued elsewhere that really you can show stage by stage reliance of the moderns and the classical to even change it. In fact, you cannot, you cannot distance yourself from a tradition, especially such a powerful tradition, if you do not assimilate elements of it into your own discourse. Meanwhile, Iranian nationalism was making inroads into the minds and hearts of the country's citizens. Over the rubble of the linguistic homeland, that vast dwelling place of culture, various claimants to the, to the legacy of classical Persian poetry began to build imaginary homes in smaller territories that are now the modern countries of Iran, Afghanistan, and Tajikistan, reducing distant memory the, to, uh, to distant memory the remainder of a civilization once unified, or at least, in, at least in the imagination of its poets and other thinkers. They then had to invent an imaginary, imaginary padlocks and crossbars, wooden or metal bolts, and walls and barriers of all sorts to keep out the other claimants. And that's the unfortunate thing in modern era, how the pieces of that, that, that patrimony, that relic of the past, uh, is being fought over between, uh, between Iranians, Afghanistan. Of course, Iran, because it's the most resourceful and the vastest of these cultures, it has been able more or less to appropriate all of it in the name of Iran. So that now, every classical poet that had nothing to do with the land of Iran, such as Mahmoud Saad Salman or Abu Haf Sogdi or Rudaki or anyone else, is now being named as Iranian. Uh, so they began to view the other, the other contributors to this glorious tradition, not as brothers, but as others. <laughs> 
At the same time, the demands of literary modernism fostered a new spirit of pilgrimage among the Iranian elite. The young and talented Iranians who traveled to Austria and France in Abbas Mirza's famed caravans of knowledge gave us a whole translation movement which really enabled us to build on later on in the century and all over the 20th century. I have a, a part that I talk about Khatrat Haj Sayyah and Safarname uh, Ibrahim Beg by Zainal Abidin Maraghi. I'll leave that aside, but I'll go to my final paragraph. A generation or two later, men like Qazvini and Taghizade, Dehkhoda and Jamalzade and Hidayat literally went to school in Europe. They viewed Europe not as a site of exile, living or expatriate settlement, but as schools, even shrines, to be observed, touched, and yes, explored for ennoblement, edification, and emulation, points of comparison to be explored. And they did some, of course, in all sincerity, for the greater good of the motherland, its people, and yes, for rejuvenating Iran's literature. Tormented souls they were indeed, and the reading of the classics most clearly reflects that torment in their soul. They read the transnational and heterogeneous past of Persian literature from, from an evolving uh, mythology of national, national, nationalist Iranian identity that negated the internationalism of Persian classics and erased the hybridized aspects of the literary past, shuttling back and forth between the need for ever more ancient origins on the, on the one hand and the desire for self-origination between departure and return, between the desire for closure and the realization of literature's eternal open-endedness, they resembled nomads who, upon arrival in the pasture that they had sought far, far and long, found land scorched. What they never realized was that their des destination was always simply missing, not there, not existent in the, out, in the world out there, but inside that tradition. But that's another story, and you'll have to wait for it until tomorrow. Thank you very much.